the message. Thank you. Claudia, it's John Zorn. Are you there? I don't know if you're in New York or what, but I got your package. And don't worry, everything's fine. I want to do this movie, absolutely. The pictures you sent look great. And um, when you're back in New York, we'll, you know, get together. We'll, you know, do the interview, the talking. You can shoot some stuff at my house. And, um, you know, we'll proceed on this just bit by bit. You've got to be patient, and it's all going to be fine. As a matter of fact, the shoot at his house didn't happen either, although I went there much earlier, years before actually. At that time I was planning to go to Japan. I thought filming in Tokyo would be important because he had spent so much time there in the past. That would have been another possible story, but that's not what happened. Now he told me that Japan didn't mean to him what it once meant. What? I was really interested in what was really obsessing me at that particular time was kind of a rediscovery of who I was. I spent a lot of time in Japan and um, it really caused me to think a lot about my own identity, about the language I spoke. And I came back to New York after some bitter experiences of alienation in Tokyo and uh, I was looking for something to really embrace me, something that I could belong to. And we began to talk, Rebo, Anthony, um, London, a lot of people began talking about uh, the idea of where Jewish culture had gone, where it came from. It meant a lot to me to think about my identity in those ways. And uh, at that time, community has a different feel now, I think, than it used to have. People talk about all oh, the Paris of the 20s and 30s with people in coffee shops sitting around talking about philosophy and art and this and that. It's a little different now. It's not the same. But in 91 and 92, a bunch of us would get together at Ratner's or at the 2nd Avenue Deli and talk about what it meant, uh, what it was, what it could be. For me, it was just the beginning of something. It was, uh, it was really, it felt really good. It made a lot of sense. And the idea of taking Jewish music into the 21st century, trying to give it some kind of sense of direction uh, trying to explore what its possibilities were, the same way that jazz musicians had taken Dixieland and moved it towards swing and then moved it towards bop and then moved it towards the avant-garde in the 60s. You could go from Jelly Roll Morton to Albert Eiler and Cecil Taylor in a mere 40 years, it made me think, well, couldn't that be possible with Jewish music? And it was as simple as that. It was as simple as continuing the project and the idea um, of instilling curiosity and uh, adventure into this music and into musicians who would explore it. What's interesting is here it is 15 years later and you look back at this, this one little moment and it still has an incredible impact. And, and, uh, It's like the first time that we rehearsed Cobra or something. It's like I remember that so well. There's certain musical moments in my life that were real epiphanies in a certain way. The, the recording of Godard and Spillane, the communities that were created um, in the studio with those pieces and the community that was created in, with the Cobra piece, um, the community that was created with the Masada music. Ultimately, all of my work revolves around the idea of and exists in community. That's what it's all about. And I think when I came back from Japan, I was very lonely and very hungry and, and looking for a community, something to belong to. Um, and this kind of happened and felt really good. 
And if, then, of course, immediately, you know, people started arguing and fighting, as people do, and, and uh... It felt like a family because of that. <laughs> it was more than a community, and and it it was great. It was really it was really great, and I still feel deep connections with all of these people because of those moments. The same way I feel deep connections with people that were there in the studio when we created Godard and Spillane, or were there in the at Roulette when we first rehearsed Cobra. Um, those are very, those are very pure and and almost holy moments uh, for me. Musical moments where something was discovered, something new, something remarkable. We have the fruits of our labor on record. They're there. In your case, you have it on film, um, and that's a very remarkable and magical achievement that moment was captured so early on. It's fun to see uh, um, a younger generation get inspired by what we've done and want to be involved and want to take it somewhere. And that's one of the most exciting things about what's happened. Is it's not something that existed in a small bubble from 92 to 95 and then disappeared. It's something that has been passed on from generation to generation. We really put out adventurous music, experimental music, something that asks questions. And I thought that the word radical kind of spoke for that in some kind of a way. And, and uh, I think it was radical new Jewish culture was the first way it was presented in Munich because I couldn't decide whether to just call it radical Jewish culture or new Jewish culture. So I called it radical new Jewish culture, and eventually the new is what disappeared, which was interesting. I think people liked saying, you know, the rad Jew thing was like a whole, um, it was a whole movement. And eventually kind of blossomed into um, something bigger than, than we expected. I had all kinds of ideas in my head that were just kicking around, waiting to come out uh, from improvising on various modes and scales. Uh, I had ideas of how to superimpose different scales on top of one another. I had ideas um, of tunes that weren't in the first Masada book that I always wished that were there that so we could blow, I would have to blow on. So I sat down and I said, okay, let's see if I could write a hundred tunes in a month. And uh, I wrote 100 tunes in the first month and kept going. And I wrote 100 tunes in the second month and then 100 more tunes in the third month. And I wrote 316 tunes. The second Masada book is very different than the first. Um, Greg, Dave, and Joey have all commented on it. Um, the process, obviously, was much smoother. The first book, I was really, like, with a chisel and a hammer chipping out a whole new language and I look at the notes that I did back then and phrases are written here and there and there's arrows and I'm trying to put tunes together and compositions together by taking a little this and a little that and it's all over the place it was very difficult and painful to create that music by 2004 I've been working with that language for a long time and the tunes just flowed out one after the other. There were no sketches written at all. There were no little phrases that were erased. I'd sit at the keyboard, I'd play a tune, I'd write it down with no erasures from beginning to end. I'd change key and go to a different tune. I 
I had notes on this uh, early on, trying to figure out exactly what was going on, and slowly things come to me. I, I don't always understand what I'm doing right at the beginning. Again, it's a matter of perspective. After a, a number of months or years, I can see the bigger picture and, and understand. So the first book is kind of the earthly realm, the second is the angelic, and the third is the spiritual. And...